Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1844. Be prepared to be inspired. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. Today I'm in New York with a very special guest by the name of Stephen Harris. Stephen, welcome to Cars Yeah. Do you have any gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? Absolutely. We're going to have some fun today because uh, my listeners know I'm a Porsche fanatic and I hear you're a bit of one too. So we're going to talk about that. But before I give you a proper introduction, what's one little thing I'm going to ask you to share that maybe most people may not know about you, Stephen? Hey, that's a hard one. I learned to drive when I was nine years old. Nine? On a Jeep on a farm. And I was allowed to drive wherever I wanted. And as long as I got home in time for dinner. You were uh, okay. It was okay. I was okay. It was like, you know, about 300 acres and it belonged to uh, friends. And uh, I learned to drive a clutch when I was nine, which, of course, no child can do now. I mean, uh, you can't even rent a car with a clutch anywhere. Well, exactly. Well, it sounds like my son, he learned to drive when he was eight in a VW Bug on a right. farm. So, uh -huh. uh, yeah. Good, it's a good place to learn. Bounce across the fields. And Jeeps yeah. and Bugs are great cars to learn in. Easy clutches. You don't have to right. worry about grinding them too much and so forth. So uh, so that's what kind of started it for you. Well, let me give you a proper introduction. And we're going to dive into something you've done very nice for the Saratoga Automobile Museum. Stephen Harris is an architect in New York and professor of architecture at Yale. He grew up in northern Florida, but he got out of there as soon as he could learn how to drive. Uh, his uncle had a 1958 356 coupe. Ooh, year I was born, one of my favorites. Yep. And his father let him take his 67S to university. I had a, an S as well, and I don't think he's ever gotten over it. In addition to collecting Porsche, Stephen drives them as well, which is very cool. He participated in the Peking to Paris rally in 2010, the Great American Challenge in 2014, the California Melee, uh, the Colorado Grand, Rams Horn, Copper State, and Sports Car Markets 1000 many, many times. Uh, he hates renting cars, so he keeps cars in different places like Southern California, New York, Miami, and Europe. Uh, and by the way, 16 of Stevens' Porsches are currently on display at the Saratoga Automobile Museum through the summer in Saratoga Springs, New York. We'll learn more about that and Stephen in a minute, but first a word from our valued sponsors. So keep the seatbelts on. We're talking Porsches today. We'll be right back. Summer is here, and that means long, hot days. Oh, boy. Covercraft's UVS custom sunscreens are quality-made and are incredibly fast and easy to use. Your UVS sunscreen is custom-tailored for your vehicle, and their accordion design ensures easy storage. Not only do they protect your dash and interior for maximum protection, while parking in the sun, sunscreens keep your vehicle's interior significantly cooler. They are durable. They're dependable for years of use. I have one for all my vehicles. Every time I park my car, my Covercraft sunscreen goes up in the window. You can choose from a variety of colors, including the original, Premier Series, and Carhartt designs. Your sunscreen is manufactured with the quality and attention to detail that's been the standard for Covercraft since 1965. And they make a really great gift as well. Get your summer deal today. Use the code YEAH21, Y-E-A-H-21, at Covercraft.com, and you'll get 10% off your Covercraft order. That's right. 10% off. Use the code YEAH21 at checkout. Covercraft, protecting the things that move you. When it was time to renew my collector car policy, my carrier raised my rates by a lot. But why? My usage was the same, my car's value was the same, and I had never made a claim. I didn't even have a ticket. The only change was their rate, and they had no reason why. What's with that? I researched my options, I spoke to others, and with American Collectors Insurance is where I now have my policy. What a difference. A live person actually answers the phone. She spent time learning about me and my Porsche Turbo, the one I call my orange crush, and provided a reasonable quote. American Collectors Insurance now protects my special ride. I'm saving hundreds of dollars and I can sleep at night knowing my baby is properly insured. Why wait until your next premium is due? Give them a call today for your personal agreed value quote. Call 866-AC1-YEAH. That's 866 866 
224-9324. Tell them you're a friend of mine, Mark Green at Cars Yeah. American Collectors Insurance, classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors, automotive enthusiasts just like you and me. That's American Collectors Insurance. Okay, Steve, and so we're back. So I want to dive a little deeper into the corner and talk more about you and your passion for Porsches. I know we're talking about the Saratoga Museum today. We're talking about Porsches, but could you give us a brief little background on the kind of architect you are? Because my listeners know my father was an architect. He designed a lot of homes, some commercial buildings, mostly private homes for people, but I have a deep affection for architects because I grew up with one, right? So tell us a little bit about that, and then we're going to dive into your passion for Porsche. I do principally residential work. I am fascinated by two adjacent ideas about it. One is I care passionately about how people actually live. I'm incredibly curious about it. I care who sleeps on which side of the bed, who gets up first. Are you right-handed or left-handed? Where do you spend most of your time? Because I think making a house for someone is a fairly bespoke act. In the same way you can make a jacket that accommodates your left arm being longer than your right, you can make a house that accommodates how you live. It can have a kind of, a kind of effortlessness and inevitability about it. The other is I'm obsessed with how buildings relate to their landscapes. I think too many contemporary houses are like a piece of sushi sitting on a plate. And instead, I think there is this kind of reciprocal relationship where the house could only be where it is. And the site is designed to accommodate that. So we sort of uh, overlap those two kinds of agendas and create things which I'm very happy with. We've uh, been doing it for quite a long time. And I have some great Having taught at Yale for so long, I've been able to cherry pick for the last 30 years the best and brightest students of mine. Very smart. That's why I teach. I learn more from them than they do from me. Well, that's awesome. Well, I love to hear this. And, you know, my father being an architect, he taught me how to see things in a different way and observe and look at things. It's almost a curse to this day because I'm obsessed with details sometimes, Some sometimes so much so that I may not see the whole forest because I'm so focused on that one tree. But I appreciate what he did for me. And he also got me into cars, which is where we're going to go today. And we're going to take you. He loved Porsches, but his first car was a 49 MGTC, and Uh so he loved old classic cars. But I've always loved Porsches like you, Stephen. Uh, I had a 67 or 72 911 S. I've had many 911s, but not as many as you have. So take us into how you got consumed. Your dad obviously letting you take a car, a Porsche car to to university. That was pretty darn nice of him. Uh, My dad let me ride my bike to university, so that's that's (laughs) about all I got. But uh, so how how did the passion of Porsche come along? Was it that that 67? I knew a lot about cars from the time I was three or four years old. I knew the name of every car on the road. My grandmother's housekeeper had a 54 Buick Roadmaster convertible. It was pink. Her name was Tilly. Wow. And she taught me the name of all the cars, even before I could pronounce them. Uh, so I was obsessed with cars. And then when, I, when my uncle had the 58 uh, 356, I fell in love with it immediately. I still remember what it smelled like what it sounded like, what its color was, everything about it. There was something sort of magical about that car. And then when I learned how to drive properly, I found out that Porsches were also amazing cars to drive. There are very few cars made in the 50s that are actually really good driving cars. Maybe Lancia, maybe Alphas. Most Mercedes from the 50s drive like tanks. And I think that the kind of light and delicate, transparent way in which they drive I was obsessed with that. And, you know, I know a lot about a lot of different kinds of cars, but I guess at some point there is a kind of emotional branding that happens in your head that you never get over. Yeah. And I think that's that's part of it. So I began with cars that were like the ones that my father and my uncle had, a 356, a 911. And then the more you look at them and the more you study them and this, that and the other, the more discriminating you get about them. As soon as you begin to love 356s, then you discover well, there was this funny one called a Carrera that had this Furman 4 cam motor. Yeah. It sounded, it sounded really good, you know, and it smelled funny because they ran bean oil and they were just amazing little cars. So then all of a sudden, that little pushrod 58 turned into um, a 57 Carrera GT Speedster. Oh, nice. And the same with the 911s. I think like you, the 72 is a favorite because it's got that oil door on the wrong side. (laughs) Uh, But I think that when I began with those, 
I learned more and more about them. And I began to understand that there are, as one learns to discriminate among them, you develop favorites and you find cars that are special to you. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little unimaginative and flat footed. So I tend to collect things in series. You know, I want um, one of each of these and one of each of those Mm -hmm. and things of that sort. So initially I was fascinated by the 73 Carrera RS, you know, the first time that Porsche had a car with the back wheels wider than the front ones. And then I discovered that as a homologation car, it was one of the first of the homologation cars. And then I began looking at homologation cars. So I became obsessed with the RSs. So I've, over the last 20 years, managed to come up with one of every RS. Oh, my from, gosh. <laughs> from 73 to 2019. Uh, you know, and even things like an SCRS from 84, a 74 3 liter, a 2011 4 liter, all of those. So, you know, they, I tend to collect things in series. People collect all different kinds of cars for all different kinds of reasons. And I'm probably one of the least imaginative ones <laughs> because I only really collect one brand. And I also cannot, I've tried before to get a Porsche which had the engine in the middle or the front and it didn't. It didn't do it for me. I mean, for me, a Porsche has the engine in the back. Right. And so I've had a Boxster Spider, which I kept for about 20 minutes. And, <laughs> you know, I never fell for the 928. But so the transaxle cars have never really been as emotionally resonant for me. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you know what you want and you've stuck with it. And one of the great things about you, Stephen, and and many collectors who share their automobiles is you've sent a bunch of these, 16 of these, to the Saratoga Museum where they've got them on display right now. And you know, a lot of collectors just tuck their cars away. They don't share them. They hide them away. They might take them to a Concours. But you're sharing your vehicles, which I think is so important because when you start to acquire these things, especially in the series like you have, there are some people who have never seen some of these vehicles, and this is an opportunity for them to go see them. And I understand you sit on the board for the Saratoga? Yeah. I am. What's that experience been like for you? <laughs> um, I have a house not too far from Saratoga. I live in Manhattan, but I have a house upstate because it's a good place to keep a bunch of cars and some nice roads to get there. But At the time that I joined the board, and I guess this was about 10 or 12 years ago, one of the board members happened to be the brother-in-law of the head of the New York State Highway Patrol, which proved to be a very useful, you know, sort (laughs) of connection connection to have. (laughs) Yes, a good connection. And then, you know, I admire their – what they're trying to do. They do a lot of safe driving things for teenagers. They're doing driving courses. They are preserving the cult of the car. I know McKeel Haggerty has done a lot with making sure that the next generation of people coming up also enjoy the cars as well. So I think that all we can do to enhance that, to bring people along, to have them come to understand both the history of the cars and enjoy driving them, enjoy looking at them, all of those things. Because, you know, independent of many other things, Porsches, particularly 356s, are exquisite objects. Every piece of metal on a 356 is curving in two directions. Very few of the parts are interchangeable. The hood off of one A coupe will not fit another A coupe without, you know, a lot of serious work. So they really are handmade, beautifully crafted things. You know, one can wax rhapsodic about the hood release or the, particularly in the earlier cars, the little um, ivory plastic knobs on the radio, you know, Mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. And yet... They're brilliantly designed in terms of how much space they have in them. When we drove the 356 from Peking to Paris, we could have been in top hats. You know, there was so much space inside this little tiny car. You know, we in some ways had more space than pre-war Bentleys did on the same rally. I like to ask my guests about driving inspirations. And excuse the pun, but there's a reason for this. And that is key mentors, perhaps in your life or things that have inspired you as a collector and as a sharer of your automobiles and your involvement with the Porsche Mark in particular. Has there been a big influential person or inspiration in your life that that helped you with this passion you have for this, Mark? Um, About probably 25 years ago, I had a student at Yale whose name was Austin Kelly. Through him, I met his father, a man named Prescott Kelly. That Prescott and Kelly? That Prescott Kelly. Wow. And he and I have been good friends for a very, very long time. And he has been 
very helpful in educating me, helping me understand things of that sort. The other person is a man named Hayden Burville. Hayden is Australian. He created a company called Wevo, and he's formerly Hurley Haywood's sort of race engineer for Brumos. And he was my co-driver on Peking to Paris. He's a brilliant industrial designer. And I came, I've learned so much from him about progressive fine-tuning and adjusting and calibrating things and the balance of a car. It's very easy to take a car and put too much power in it. To get a car where the power and the suspension and the tires and everything are perfectly uh, in balance with one another is very, very special. And he's brilliant at that. He's built two cars for me, one the Picking to Paris car, and the other, I have a 73 sort of hot rod, which he built and... <laughs> It's actually, I know Rob Dickinson, who created The Singer, and I think you've interviewed him before. But if you go to his book, there are two pages devoted to a little car called Shatang, S-H-T-A-N-G. And Hayden built that car. And we were on an R group rally in Central California 16 or 17 years ago. And I tossed it in the keys and said, why don't you drive this? Well, this is a car that Hayden had put together and made perfectly balanced. He drove that car came back and said, I have to build one of these. Oh. Or, and that led to the singer. Um, wow. So, uh, no, it's a, you know, I think very few people are more knowledgeable about Porsches in terms of the numbers they made, the this, that, or the other, the, the models, the specifications, how they drive, than Prescott. I, th- I know of no one who is better at fine-tuning, crafting. I mean, he, the cars that Hayden has built for me he had the shocks built for it. And there's a different shock that he had built for a 356A coupe than he has for a 356 Beatster. Mm-hmm. Because the slightly difference in weight and the uh, torsional rigidity of the chassis and things of that sort are all factored into that. There's a third car that he's building now, which he's been building for about 10 years, which hopefully will be finished in another year. <laughs> Come on, Hayden. Move along. <laughs> You know, it's fantastic. I love it. If you were going to advise somebody who wanted to start collecting, and it doesn't have to be Porsches, but collecting cars, whether it's a collection of two cars or many, many cars, what would you share with them to help them get a great start? Two things, and they're slightly contradictory, but not uh, ultimately. One is buy what you love. Disregard resale value, disregard investment potential, disregard all of that. Find a car that you love to drive or you love to wash, because I think sometimes you have to wash a car to know it. Uh, you have to understand, you know, I mean, I get you have it. to literally touch it. Yeah. The other is by what you know. And I have a Porsche friend who happens to also be an investment banker. And when I had more than 35 cents to rub together, I asked him what I should do with it. And he said, buy what you know. Yeah. And the rest will take care of itself. I mean, I've been buying cars for a while. I'm better at buying them than I am at selling them, (laughs) but uh, they are worth more than I paid for them, but that's irrelevant to me. I don't plan to sell them, but, you know, it it makes you feel less profligate if you have in the back of your head, you know, that the insurance value of all these cars is X and you pay, you know, X over two. And it's also something where I think that As you get more specific about them, I think of myself not as the owner of these cars, but more as the kind of custodian of them. I will be taking care of them for a while, and at some point, they will go to someone else. And it's my job to maintain them, to take care of them, to drive them, things of that sort. Well, it leads us back to museums and the importance of museums, whether they're automotive museums or art museums or whatever they might be, that we are caretakers of all these things. So very well said, Stephen. We're going to take a short break. And we come back, I have a bit of what I like to call a challenge question for you. So sit tight and we'll be right back. What began as a charitable car show has grown into the world's greatest collector car auctions, raising over $133 million for charitable organizations to date. For nearly 50 years, automotive enthusiasts from all over the world have enjoyed the Barrett-Jackson Collector Car Auctions, and I'm a huge fan. Regarded as the barometer of the collector car industry, their auctions are world-class lifestyle events where thousands of the world's most sought-after unique and valuable automobiles cross the block in front of a global audience, in person, on TV, or streamed online. 
Barrett Jackson produces the world's greatest collector car auctions in Scottsdale, Arizona, Palm Beach, Florida, Las Vegas, Nevada, and new for 2021, Houston, Texas. The excitement of Barrett Jackson auctions is contagious and a unique experience is not to be missed. And coming soon, something new for you Cars Yeah listeners. I'll be teaming up with Craig Jackson on the first ever Barrett Jackson podcast, coming to your mobile devices every week. Listen here on Cars Yeah and check out the Barrett Jackson website for unique details on this new exciting podcast that I'm very proud to be a part of. And be sure to visit BarrettJackson.com today. Barrett Jackson, the world's greatest collector car auctions. All right, we're back. So I typically ask my guests about a big challenge that relates to their business, but I want to change this up a little bit. I'd love for you to talk about perhaps a big challenge in a vehicle that you own that you either the challenge came from the chase, the find, or the restoration, but something that really kind of caught you off guard, set you on the back of your heels, and you went, what am I getting into here? So take us on a little bit of a bumpy journey, if you will, Stephen. Um, many of the cars I have are either totally original, and there are very few of those, or they've been restored. The ones that I've restored, I tend to rather restore the car myself than buy somebody else's restoration, because I know who did it. I've seen the restoration. I trust the people who have done it. And I think that I spend a lot of time keeping track of who's the best person to do this, who's the best person to do that. There's a man named Jeff Adams, who is probably the preeminent Porsche 4Cam mechanic in the world. He's one of three who are potentially even in the running. And he's restored over 100 Furman 4Cam motors. And if you know anything about them, they're maniacally complicated. Yes. One of the things that I'm in the middle of now is I was just I just had the opportunity to acquire the last Porsche Carrera GT Speedster to leave the factory. Wow. 1959. Cool. Uh, it was built for um, Harry Shell, who was at the time a Porsche racing driver. Although it's the third from the last serial number, it was the last to leave the factory. Because at the time, Porsche was – the um, 59 Carrera GT Speedsters were only available to either preferred clients who, who would race them or factory drivers. They were fairly keen that the privateers not defeat the factory drivers. Mm. So speculation <laughs> is that this car stayed an extra two weeks to get a few more sort of bells and whistles added to it. Harry Shell died the following year in an accident in Maserati. And the car was sold to Venezuela. And it was in Venezuela. It was raced in Cuba. It was raced in Peru. It was raced all over the place. And I was lucky enough to be able to acquire it as a how to put this charitably, uh, a restoration project. Okay. <laughs> and so, you know, it's one of those things of where the body goes here, the engine goes there, the interior goes there. I've been using, he's restored quite a few cars for me. He's brilliant. A man named Jim Newton at Automobile Associates of Canton, Connecticut. He does almost all of my 356 work. He's a Almost as old as me, which is always a dangerous thing. Always have your restorers much younger than you. Much younger. <laughs> yes. And your mechanics. Uh, luckily, Jeff Adams is, you know, at least 25 years younger than me. Then Victor Miles, who is this genius in California, who restores trim and metal parts for cars. Everything from steering, I mean, from steering columns to taillights to headlights to all, the, you know, to steering wheels to all those sorts of things. He had been sort of stockpiling things over the years that he was going to save for a special car or something of that sort. I've known Victor for a very long time. And when I told him that I had gotten this car, he said, there's no better home for these pieces than that car. Uh -huh. So we're assembling piece by piece all the little things that were missing off the car or that were broken or that had been replaced at a previous time. Mm -hmm. The engine, when I bought the car, was still in a crate. It had been restored by a well-known German Porsche, three, um, Porsche 4 cam person. Mm -hmm. I had it shipped straight to Jeff Adams. Jeff Adams began looking at it. He didn't like this little thing about it. And he began taking it apart. And of course, you know, inevitably, it's not built. Too many people buy four cam motors or four cam cars and push them into the trailer and out of the trailer mm -hmm. and say, is it this pretty? And it will start. I drive mine on the Colorado Grand at 110 miles an hour. And to do that, at sustained speed requires the engine really be sorted properly. You know, it's not just something that is okay. So that's being done now. And 
my challenge with that car right now is I've told Jim and Jeff that I want to drive this car, you know, and I'm not getting any younger. Yeah, let's and get so, it done. <laughs> no, this is not a five-year restoration project. This is a one-year restoration project if they can do it. So, Do we have an end date? <laughs> is that set? Uh, I have told him that I wanted to go to Amelia. Okay. I take cars to Concourse because it gives you a good place to park. <laughs> Now, there's a quote. I'm going to write that one down. <laughs> you know, I do not take Q-tips to the inside of exhaust pipes, and I do not pick grass out of the treads or put little cozies on the tires. It's interesting that the last three Carrera GT Speedsters that were made, I have the third from, in terms of, of uh, chassis number. I have the third from the last. Bob Ingram and Cam of Road Scholars have the second to the last, and Ralph Lauren recently bought the third. Oh. The third last. They were all three the same color, ruby red. And because of that fire at the, uh, the Ingrams, at, at the Ingrams, they are re-restoring that car. I'm restoring mine. And what's, what's Ralph up to? <laughs> he painted his white. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Which is a very bizarre thing to do because everyone knows these last three cars were all the same color. Red? Yeah. I wonder why he did that. He paints cars whatever color he wants. Whatever he wants. And yeah, they're exactly. his cars. They're his cars. And the next guy could put it back to the, the original color. Sure. So, you know, there's a lot of conversation back and forth between me and Bob Ingram and Cam about, you know, ex making sure we get exactly the right shade. And we're both interested in making it not look wet. In other words, that it has a little bit of flattening agent in it. So it looks like a real car in that way. Nice. Uh, sounds fantastic. Well, let's get back to Saratoga because I'd love for you. We can't talk about all the cars. We don't have the time. There's 16 vehicles. Uh, a couple questions with that. Did you select the vehicles to go to the museum or did they ask for those vehicles? Um, when they asked me, they asked me to do this. There were, there were two exhibitions that came together the same year, purely by accident. Uh, in 2020, Lime Rock had asked me to be the featured collector, which, I mean, I think they had exhausted their list of anybody else oh, they could think come of. On. <laughs> um, and I could have said, you know, I will send these cars because they're big and fancy. And, you know, everybody will say, oh, aren't you lucky to have all these expensive cars? I chose instead for the Lime Rock show to do the entire run of the RSs. Wow. Because I thought it from a kind of didactic point of view, the idea of being able to see the development of one model. Mm -hmm. over almost 50 years. In 2023, it'll be the 50th anniversary. Or 2022, depending upon whether you're German or American, the 73 RS will be 50 years old. Mm. And if you line them all up, just look at the tails, you know, as they change over the whole length of that. It went from, you know, obviously the Metzger motored cars up until the 996 when they went to the water-cooled cars and um, the other and newer motor mm -hmm. at that point. So that was the idea for that one. Then when Saratoga had a hold in their schedule and they were slightly panicked, they, you know, sort of asked the board, does anybody have any cars we can show next summer? So the, they knew I had some Porsches and that they were doing this other thing. So I decided for that, I would focus on air-cooled cars only. And so there are five of the Furman 4Cam Carreras. There's a 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, and 63. And then there are a couple of, there's that car I referred to as Chetang. Mm -hmm. That's the combination of my first two initials and the word tangerine. Because Hayden had several of my cars and there was Chetang and Shaga and Schleim and Shiver. Schleim. <laughs> yeah, Schleim. Schmlazel, Schmiesel. Wasn't there a TV show about that or something? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Because of the connection to the singer. And then there was the, the Picking to Paris car is there. And the last or the most recent of all of the air-cooled cars is a 993 GT2, nice. which is the, you know, probably the ultimate, or at least it was called the Widowmaker, as you know. I mean, it, it's, it, it's a, a 600 and change horsepower, rear-engined, turbocharged uh, car, you know, the one with the stapled on fenders. But um, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, that was, again, an idea of almost from Furman to Metzger. Yes. It's those two things. And you can see the development of the air-cooled cars as they go. There's a little bit of overlap. So the museum show will end a couple of days before Labor Day so that they can be transported down to Lime Rock, which is about two hours away. And then after Lime Rock, all the RSs will come to the museum. 
So from after Labor Day until probably around Thanksgiving, there will be the entire run of RSS. I think there's 16 of those as well. Wow, fantastic. I love it. You know, I always ask my guests about a special vehicle story. One light car in their life that really stands out. This has got to be an almost impossible question. I'm not going to ask you your favorite because it'd be like asking <laughs> what's your favorite child. Exactly. However, if there was was one vehicle, let's narrow it down to what's at Saratoga right now, okay? That okay. might make it a little bit easier. If there's one vehicle in that group that stands out, which one is it? If I if I take out the picking to Paris car and I take out Chatang. Okay. <laughs> the car that I've driven the most is probably a 1956 Carrera Coupe. It's a real Carrera that was raced by a judge in South Carolina running a pushrod engine uh, about 25 years ago. Jerry Seinfeld then asked Weldon and Cole Scroggum to build him the ultimate outlaw. So they started from that car. Wow. And they built a very fancy pushrod motor for it, disc brakes, uh, suspension adjustments, things of that sort. And speedster seats, those kinds of things. Well, when I I bought the car from, I think we got it from Sam Cabiglio, who is Jerry's sort of agent person. And by that point, I almost by accident, well, it's not by accident, but it was by good fortune. I had a Carrera Speedster and I had also acquired a spare Carrera motor. So I decided it was high time that if it was real Carrera, it should have a real Carrera motor. So I put, so I had Jeff Adams build me the ultimate hot rod Carrera motor to go in the ultimate hot rod that Cole Scroggum had built. And that's a 547 slash five. It's about 170 horsepower and a car that weighs almost nothing. And that's the car I've driven on the Colorado Grand, the California Melee. I mean, I've driven other ones on there, but that's the one that it's proven bulletproof reliable. And it makes more noise than you can imagine. It sets off car alarms for blocks, you know, when you're driving <laughs> around in it. It has a pea shooter Sebring exhaust. But, you know, it comes closest to being the most visceral and engaging. How it sounds, how it smells, how it handles. It has, has Hayden's shocks on it. It has a supplemental oil cooler that he invented to go behind one of the wheels and, wow. you know, all of that. So, you know, that's a kind of, it sounds a little redundant, but it's a kind of Carrera outlaw, if you will. And that that's a great car. It sounds like it. I'm going to crawl on your head here, Stephen. I'm going to be your psychologist today, okay? okay? If you woke up tomorrow and you were manifest as a vehicle, this isn't what you want to be. This is your personality, your quirks, your individualism manifest into a vehicle. What is Stephen Harris, but more importantly, why? Hey, God, that's <laughs> what I've never thought of. Oh, well, good, good. I like asking tough questions. It would not be a Porsche because Porsches are... Interesting. There's a kind of precision and minimal quality to Porsches. Nothing is extraneous. And I tend to think of myself as this cube up on legs with a bunch of ping pong balls falling out the bottom. <laughs> you know, ideas are just falling all over the place. <laughs> Maybe a Fossil Vega. Oh, my goodness. Okay, this is very interesting. All right. You know, with a Pont de Mousson four-speed in it and, right. you know, uh, and a Chrysler Hemi. Yeah. You know. Um, those beautiful tail lights with the little initial in them. Yes. And also because who owned them? You know, uh, Albert Camus had one as well as Frank Sinatra, as well as a bunch of other people. So, you know, it, it has a kind of scattered and effusive thing. And, it's, and I also think they, it may be an acquired taste, but I think they're very beautiful. I wish I were. <laughs> uh, hey, you're doing fine, buddy. You're doing just fine. Very interesting. I, I love the way you answered that. And it's not the way I thought you would answer that, but that's what makes this question very fun. Many times people trick me with their yep. answers. So I think that's really, really great. I, I like to ask my guests about a great book that they've read. This could be a Porsche book or anything, a business book or fiction, whatever. But is there a book that you'd like to share with our uh, listeners that you found really, uh, really enjoyable? This is a book I probably read 50 years ago, and it's called The First Third. It was written by a guy named Neil Cassidy. Neil Cassidy was the bus driver for Ken Kesey. If you remember the electric Kool-Aid acid test and, and that kind of hippie beat, oh, yeah. uh, Jack Kerouac crossing yeah. the country yeah. at the time. And what's fascinating about it is he said 
when he was writing it, that it was the first third. The reason it's called the first third is it was the first third of an autobiography or a memoir. And it said that he wrote about the first third. He lived the second third and he died before the third third could be done. But it's a fascinating, almost unselfconscious, direct experiential thing about the Merry Pranksters. And those, I mean, I, I started college in 1968. I went to Woodstock. You know, I, you know, had a great time and all of that stuff. I wouldn't change it for the world. And I think that there was a kind of authenticity in that period, which no one was professionally ambitious. Everyone was out to save the world. And there was a kind of, on the one hand, idealism, and on the other hand, sort of great, I guess, naivete about all of it, which I find so refreshing and so unlike, you know, the kind of highly mediated life we all have now, you know, where everything has so many implications that you have to be so careful about all of this. Yes, getting a little tiring, isn't it? I think, yep. uh, yeah. The first third, first time anybody's mentioned that book here on cars. Yeah, so I appreciate you bringing that up. Bring back some memories for me as well. So, uh, but you were a child. You were ten years old in 1968. I was. So, yes, yeah. I was. But still, you know, I was there. I was living in Southern California. Yeah, you know, you were in Southern California, so you were ahead of the game. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, my parents, my dad being an architect, and he had long hair. I had long hair. I, yeah, I was, you know, psychedelic shirts. There you go. Right. Very cool. We're gonna take one more short break. We we come back we're going to go on the ultimate drive which will be very interesting for me to hear your choice for this because you have taken what many of us would call ultimate drives in these great cars you own so sit tight we'll be right back i've discovered linkage it's a new quarterly publication and website that covers the automotive market driving restoring collecting and discovering your passion for motor vehicles linkage is about experiences opinions and values Linkage is an actual, informed, reasoned opinion based on first-hand experiences. A talented Linkage team covers the automotive world, the people who share your passion and mine, smart, considered, rational, and experienced opinions, ones you can learn from and grow. That includes our passion that drives auctions and the collector car market. So come with me and join us on this journey. And be sure to use the code CARS YEAH when you subscribe, and they'll give you $10 off. Boom! Linkage, geared for the automotive life. Subscribe today at LinkageMag.com. So here's the deal, Stephen. The ultimate drive is something very magical. It's something that I can make happen for you. You get to choose the car, you get to choose a person that you're with. This could be somebody living or deceased. And where are you going to be driving? So let's start with the vehicle. It doesn't have to be your car. It could be a car that you wish you had or some other car, something different maybe. Depending upon where we're going, I would choose one of my cars. Okay. There are no other cars in the world that I had rather drive than the ones I already have. Perfect. I have no desire to drive, you know, a McLaren P1, you know, or any of that stuff. Okay. Do you have, a, right. you have one in particular? Let's, let, let's just pick it for today. Let's figure out where we're going to go first. Oh, I like it. Okay. Because, you know, you drive a different car for a different road. Yep. And a a different kind of thing. For driving, I think some of the best roads I've driven have been in Northern California. They're a group of crazies. A long time ago, probably 10 or 12 years ago, there was something called the Iron Bottom Motoring Tour. And it was run by an 80-year-old guy out of Nevada. And... You just showed up at the Rose Bowl, paid your 30 bucks, and you were given the route. It was on a Thursday, so there was very little traffic. And primarily, the roads were between the 101 and I-5. And if you know things like 33 out of Ojai, 58, you know, across to the 101, um, Nascimento Road down to 1, things like that. That's a great, great set of roads. And you could take that through all the back roads in between those two major roads all the way up to either Bend or Portland, Oregon. If I could have anybody as a co-driver or as a driver, I would navigate for this guy. Okay. I would use Hurley Haywood. Ah, nice. I grew up in Northern Florida. I knew who Hurley was from the time I was about 14. Uh, He's two years older than me, and uh, I've always had so much admiration for him. If you've ever ridden with him and watched his feet, uh, (laughs) he is the most, they're just magic. He has tiny feet, you know. I think he wears like a size five shoe. And it's amazing to watch this kind of almost ballet. And 
He's the most natural driver I know. There's nothing, I mean, he could drive incredibly quickly and very smoothly and apparently without any effort. So, yeah, great guy. He's been a guest here on the show. And coincidentally, the day we're recording the show, Stephen, uh, Sean Cridlin, who wrote a wonderful book with Hurley about Hurley's life. Yeah, it's called uh, Hurley. Right. Hurley, right. Uh, has a new book coming out called Brumos, which is the huh. history of Brumos. It's a three book series. And uh, his show is airing the day we're recording your show here. But uh, definitely. So Hurley Haywood, you're in Northern California somewhere. And what are you guys in? Got to be a Porsche, obviously. I think <laughs> only because he just had Rod Emery build him one. Oh, yeah. A speedster. Yeah. A 356 speedster. And prob- I mean, probably out of 57, we'll have, I have three Carrera speedsters. But the one that I would probably use for that is the 57 Carrera GT speedster. Oh, nice. That would be great fun. Uh, and, you know, it's not a wildly fast car, but those roads don't require a really fast car. Yeah. You need something nimble and light. Nice. Sounds like a dream ride, ultimate drive to me. That's for sure. And you've taken us on a very nice ride today, Steve. And I can't thank you enough for spending some time and, and for sharing your vehicles and for sharing your vehicles at the Saratoga Automobile Museum where you listeners can go. And I encourage you to do that and check these cars out. Before I let you go, could you share maybe one little parting piece of wisdom, a quote, a mantra, a piece of advice you might leave us with? I think if one only collects cars and washes them and polishes them and trailers them from one concord to the next, there's a limited joy in that. I think unless you can extend and expand that to where you actually drive them as well. And I don't think you have to have a crazy fast car. I think it's more fun the older I get to drive a slow car fast than it is to drive a fast car slow. So, you know, we don't need, you know, I have cars with 700 horsepower, but um, <laughs> yeah. they're not very interesting to drive, you know, because unless you're going some insane speed, which you can't really do on any, right. any public road. On the other hand, you know, driving a 356 at 80 miles an hour is about as much fun as you can have with your clothes on. Yeah. Uh, you know, it really is a terrific thing. Yeah. So stretch and expand the range of experiences so it's not just visual it's also auditory it's you know somatic you know it's about exactly what things feel like what how they touch how they smell all of those things so you know if you can broaden it as much as possible i don't have a car that i could not get in and drive cross country nice they're all ready to go and i think that's what we should all do Drive your vehicles, most definitely. What's the best way for most people to learn more about you? I know you have a website, Stephen Harris Architects. Uh, is that the best place for people to go and learn more about you? Yep. That's the, I mean, that's a website that shows a lot of our work. We have an Instagram account, I think. There's someone, <laughs> I have a very smart young woman who was my student at Yale, and she's actually from uh, Sarajevo. Oh, wow. But she speaks idiomatic English better than any American because she came to it from the outside. Yes. So uh, our Instagram account, I think is Stephen Harris Architects. That makes you know, sense. So there's another one that's a sleeper that, that I very rarely post to, but it's got a lot of pictures of Porsches on it. It's called Stephen Harris 7344. I don't know where that number came from or who set it up, but there. Is that Instagram? Yep. Okay. That's Instagram. Also follow Jamie Lipman. James Lipman is probably the best car photographer currently working he photographed all the cars for the museum and they're putting together a book yes you know a kind of catalog of all of this stuff absolutely i'll definitely put all those links on steven's show notes page and of course you can go to the saratoga automotomuseum.org and you'll find uh, stories there and the book that's coming out that you can get your hands on but more importantly try to make your way there and see this wonderful collection. You can find all of this on Stephen's show notes page. And a great shout out and a thank you to Dustin Lannerman, who uh, works at the Saratoga Automobile Museum. He's the one that introduced me to Stephen. So Dustin, thank you for putting this together. I really appreciate it. Stephen, this has been a delight. Uh, I think I could spend hours talking Porsches with you for sure. Uh, Until you and I talk again, I hope to see you down the road. Okay, thank you, Mark. As Bruce Meyer says, uh, never lift. Absolutely. Another past cars. Yeah, guest here. We run in the same circles, which are pretty cool circles indeed. They're great people. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Did you know that Cars Yeah! is in the top 1% of all podcasts based on listenership, according to Libsyn, the premier RSS feed for podcasts in the United States? That's right. And Cars Yeah! is the only five-day-a-week automotive-focused podcast for you to get your message into the ears of thousands of listeners daily from all over the world. Plus, DuPont Registry recommended Cars Yeah! is one of their top 10 car podcasts for you to enjoy. Cars yeah! has experienced tremendous growth, plus your ads are evergreen, meaning they never go away. And more and more listeners find Cars yeah! every day for their daily dose of automotive inspiration. Do you want to expose your brand to a highly targeted list of automotive enthusiasts in a very unique in very personal way, well, I can help you. Contact me, Mark Green, at mark at carsyad.com or through the website at carsyad.com today to learn more. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to carsyad.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!